afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining another Barometer Readings webcast. I'm Pamela Hastings, Relationship Manager here at Barometer Capital. And on today's webcast, we will provide you with a brief macro overview. And of course, at the tail end of our conversation, be pleased to address your questions. So don't be shy. You can email me at phastings at barometercapital.ca or hit us up on the Q&A or the chat via the Zoom link. And with that, on this uh, March 21st, a uh, beautiful afternoon, I turn the conversation over to the one and only David Burroughs, our Chief Investment Strategist and President here at Barometer Capital. Good afternoon, David. Hi, Pamela. How are you today? Great. Thank you so much. Looking forward to your conversation this afternoon. Well, we got lots to talk about, uh, as it has been over the last number of months, lots going on. Uh, we've got a uh, Fed meeting this week. We've had lots going on in the banking industry this past two weeks uh, and uh, and lots of reaction in the market. So uh, why don't we just take off from the top uh, and uh, as we usually do, start sort of with a macro view. Uh, look, at the end of the day, it's more about how markets react to news than the news itself. Uh, we have to make sure that we kind of stay in step with what's going on. We don't have to be everywhere. Our job, I think, at Barometer is to try to identify the key groups in the market that have some sort of tailwind that can lead to revaluation, make sure we're focused in those areas. We're always looking for new leadership as it emerges so that we can start to build our way into positions uh, and in the absence of leadership, have an ability to play some defense. Uh, we don't have to be fully invested all the time, that's for sure. Uh, and we don't have to be in every group. And so this is really very much about taking a tactical approach to things. I do these webcasts every week, partly to answer questions, uh, partly to be held accountable, uh, and partly to continue to ask the question, you know, is there something changing that we need to uh, recognize and, and make changes in portfolios? You know, there is no magic bullet. Investing is a iterative process. And we got to just make sure that we've got our wits about us, that we use the tools that we have and the processes that we have uh, to, to take things as it comes. And certainly, you know, it's been an interesting market. Just from a top-down view, from equities perspective, there's the S&P 500 back to 1981. Uh, during this period, we've had two structural bull markets, the first from 1981 to 2000. And when it was over, uh, after a fairly short period of time, we broke the 200-week moving average and then spent the next well, really 13 years crisscrossing back and forth in a series of cyclical advances and declines as the equity asset class went out of favor. And then once again, we broke out to a new high in 2013. We kicked off a new structural bull market, which tend to last 13 or 15 years. Uh, by my math, we're about nine years in. Uh, and, and along the way, there are bear markets or major corrections that take place and none of them are any fun. This is 2018, this is the COVID uh, 2020 sell off in the March of that year where we briefly dipped below that 200 week moving average and then quickly recaptured it. And this is the correction that's been now going on 15 months uh, and at the worst point down 27 and a half percent, which is at the high end of a correction that would lead into a typical recession. So what is different than that when we compare, say, to a 2008-9 or 2001-2-3? Those are more significant. One was a bursting of a bubble in tech, and the second was a bursting of a bubble in financial assets and the banking industry. If you remember, in 2008-9, banks went into that period with 40 times leverage on their balance sheets. And when the housing market, which hadn't corrected in a long time, started to correct, there was a major problem and the banks melted down. We spent many years following that, having the banking industry re-regulated so that we came into this most recent banking difficulty with banks having much more capital and much less leverage. We don't actually have a major problem with the loan losses. We have had a sharp move higher in interest rates, which means that some of the bonds that they've held as, uh, as uh, assets on their balance sheet have gone down in price, some of them more than others. But we're in a very different environment today than we were in in 2008. 
but we have to keep watching to see if it turns into something more. As it sits, we came down and briefly touched on the rising 200 week moving average in October. We've retested it a few times, either each monthly bar as we remain well above it. Uh, and so far on the month, from the beginning of the month, the S&P is up about 65 basis points. Uh, if we take a look at the, the bond market and interest rates, we know that we went through a generational bottom in rates, we believe, in 2020, very similar to what we went through in the late 1940s. And what's ensued is a very sharp move higher in rates, not dissimilar to what happened in the early 1950s. Now, during that period, interestingly enough, there were corrections, but the stock market rallied from 1951 through 1966 while rates went higher. The automatic assumption that higher rates can't be handled by the broader economy is incorrect, right? The 1950s and 1960s, there were bouts of inflation, but the stock market did very well and especially dividend growth stocks through that period. But it doesn't mean there weren't sharp corrections along the way. If we look at the 10 year yield in night from 1981 to 2020, we had 40 years of a tailwind from falling interest rates that helped certain types of assets. And since 2020, a sharp move higher in yields, most recently over the last number of months, chopping in a range between about 4% at the high end and 3.4% at the low end as we've consolidated this initial move higher. For bond investors, including some of the regional banks, a very difficult period. If you take an ETF made up of 20 to 30 year bonds, the TLT, from the spring of 2020 through the worst point in October, that ETF was down 48%. Now, there's some distributions that come from that interest payments that would help offset some of that, but that's a huge drop in price. Now, we know that the banks hold bonds on their balance sheets. They're not asked to mark them to market. So a lot of them are holding fairly large unrealized losses, some more than others. And Silicon Valley Bank Corp was a great example. It caused a major problem for them, problem with their assets. When we look at commodities, commodities reversed a bear market that started in 2008 and 2020, rallied sharply and over the last number of months have consolidated above a very long-term 200 month moving average. If we compare commodities versus the S&P, I think it was very relevant that we broke this trend back in the beginning of 2022 and since then have been consolidating above that trend line. My guess is at some point in the next few months, if not sooner, you start to see that reaccelerate because you've made that structural shift. So commodities, in our opinion, are in a structural bull market. The S&P and equities in general remain in a long-term bull market. Bonds are in a bear market. And other assets that act like bonds or are helped by falling rates have a structural headwind at this point, things like real estate or high dividend paying stocks. So one of the important assets that we continue to watch is the US dollar versus the basket of world currencies. We know that through the bear market of 2022, the US dollar rallied sharply versus the pound and the euro and the yen and the Canadian dollar. And that was money looking for a safe haven. It was also money chasing higher and higher yields as the Fed was raising rates. And around the time the stock market put in its last low in October, we saw a reversal in the US dollar and a breaking in the fever of people looking for safe haven assets, and the US dollar started to back off. We know that the US, the US stock market put in a low in October, put in another low in December, and rallied sharply through January. In the month of February, the US dollar bounced, having sold off of a significant amount, having broken long-term trend. It rallied over the course of the last month, and during that time, the stock market corrected again. So look, we came up and we talked about this over the last few weeks. We tested the point where it broke down. It was unable to get through. It was unable to get back above the long-term measure of trend, which is the 200-day moving average. And over the last number of days has been backing off. I think this is significant. 
it tells us that there may not be as much a bid for a safe haven asset as what some people think. It also may mean that given the banking problems in some of the regional banks, there may be less impetus for the Fed to raise rates 50 basis points at their meeting this week. That would make the US dollar less attractive for international investors. It also probably would help risk assets. So we continue to watch this. As of today, we're back below the 50-day moving average. The 50-day moving average is below 200-day moving average. These are all measures of trend. The trend for the US dollar is lower. That is supportive of risk assets. Now, we use the tools that we have to help make our decisions. Everybody's got their own tools. We believe that 70% of return comes from getting to the right asset class. So within the right asset class, finding sectors or themes that have a structural tailwind. So we spend a lot of time on top-down analysis, trying to identify the big macro trends, which parts of our investable universe have a tailwind. Where is money getting put to work today? 20% of return comes from finding very specific securities to express our view. So our fundamental research team, led by Jim Skatakis, does work by trying to identify securities that have financial characteristics and technical characteristics that point to something that is good getting better, where we can see an expanded multiple and higher prices, where we can find areas of the market that are showing net new inflows of capital and find securities within those groups to express our view that meet our fundamental and technical tests. Well, that's where our portfolio lives. And it's a living, breathing thing. We have shocks to the system. We have shifts in the economy. We have changes in the underlying businesses. And all of them mean we need to have a very disciplined selling strategy because we only need 20 to 30 securities in a portfolio to be diversified. There's 60 odd thousand that we could choose from. So we need to have a very disciplined selling strategy to make sure, make the analogy that if we had a store and we had inventory on the shelf that wasn't selling, that we would know to mark it down and get rid of it and replace it with inventory that's relevant that people walk into the store wanting to buy tomorrow. So the portfolio is a living, breathing thing. We use stop losses on all of our positions. It means from time to time when we get shifts from a sector move, we get stopped out. That's okay. It makes sure that little mistakes don't turn into big ones. The top-down work is driven by breadth models, where we track various universes of securities, trying to identify neighborhoods within the market that were over time a higher and higher percentage of securities are participating in a rally. That's healthy. When breadth starts to deteriorate, it doesn't mean every security will sell off. Generally, it's the weak one first. But if enough roll over, ultimately, it gets harder and harder to make money. So when breadth starts to contract, it means we stop putting new money to work. It means we tighten up the stop losses on the current positions. And to the extent we get stopped out, no new money goes in this neighborhood until we start to see expand, expansion in breadth again. So we run breadth models, or I run breadth models, on about 300 universes of securities at the market level, at the sector level, uh, at the geographic region. Uh, it's from a style perspective, trying to identify where money is being put to work and where money is leaving. Now, as of last week, and over the last few weeks, we've talked about the fact that our longer term models, for instance, the percentage stocks in the NYSE and uptrends has been deteriorating. Same thing globally. Canada has been more resilient. The percent of stocks trading above the 50 day moving averages in these various areas have been weakening. The percent of stocks with positive weekly momentum or upward trajectory has been weakening. Percent of stocks making new highs versus new lows has been weakening. Percent of stocks trading above their 150 day moving average has been weakening. It doesn't mean that everything gets hit. It doesn't mean everything breaks down. It means though that we got a headwind. It means we shouldn't be putting new positions on. And it means we always have to examine the positions that we have. Now, as of this week, things got a little bit weaker, not much. Actually, these measures stayed very, very similar. The thing we highlighted last week, though, was that the percentage of stocks with positive weekly momentum or upward price trajectory was getting to a point where it typically bottoms out. And that while the news 
is really bearish, we're getting to a point where these indicators are telling us things are getting sold out. When we go back over time, we had a brief moment in time in October of 2022. That was when the market made its low, where momentum got this low. We had a moment in time in the COVID low, October, sorry, uh, March of 2020, where we got to around this level, and then it reversed in the beginning of April, marking the bottom. We had a moment at the end of 2018, where percent of stocks with positive momentum got to 14%. And when it reversed up, that was an important low. So we watch for this. Now, I don't have the numbers from today. It's very possible that this turned higher today. But we wait and we watch. If you look at the S&P, which is one measure of the U.S. stock market, we talked about the fact that bottoming is a process. We had a low in June, a lower low in October, a higher low in December, where a much higher percentage of stocks were in uptrends. We rallied. We broke this downtrend that had been in place the entire bear market. And very often, as it happens, you break out and you pull back and you test it. So over the last week, as of last week, when we did our webcast, we were retesting this lower level. So since then, we've now had six days where we've moved higher. We're back above the 200-day moving average. We're back above this trend line that we had broken above going back into the beginning of the year. So markets are testing bottoming as a process. But by lots of measures, it looks as though it's possible that we're there. We have to see. We have to keep looking. But a lot of the technical indicators are turning back higher. If we take a little longer view, it's understandable. Markets have been frustrating over the last few years. The 2018 sell-off, a short while later, the 2020 COVID sell-off, we rallied out of it and very quickly went through a cyclical bear market over the last 15 months. But all the while, the long-term trend for this market remains higher. And we can't lose sight of that because what happens after corrections in bear markets like this is ultimately there is money to be made. So let's just go back and revisit leadership. When we look at the lows in October, we know that most sectors had a very small percentage of stocks and uptrends. Most of them were seeing deterioration. Most of them had a very narrow group of leaders. And there'd been a lot of damage. When we looked at things at the end of January, lots of sectors had moved to the right, meaning the percentage of stocks and uptrends had been expanding. We're all in capital letters. The broadest groups were the most economically sensitive, and that included industrials and basic materials. It included some financials, and it included some energy. When we look at it today, we've moved back a little bit to the left, but nowhere near where we were in December and nowhere near where we were in October. Breadth has continued to improve in steps. Interestingly, semiconductors reversed up this week, one of the most economically sensitive groups. We talked last week about tech and that in general, things were getting a little bit better, but in particular, semiconductors were the group that seemed to stand out. In this leading set of sectors, we have a lot of economically sensitive groups still, machinery, steel, builders, um, transports, forest products. So lots of more cyclical groups and the more defensive groups remain at the bottom end of the pile. One would expect if we're headed into a really weak economy, these groups would start to lead and they just have not so far. So the culprit over the last couple of weeks in the sharp decline, the worst part of the market, were the financials. Now the XLF is made up of some commercial services, uh, card providers, for instance, it's made up of insurance companies, it's made up of banks, and it's made up of regional banks. The really difficult part of this market over the last two weeks has been the regional banks. The KRE is an ETF that holds a basket of regional banks. So all banks are not created equal. We talked a little bit about this last week. Silicon Valley Bank Corp, the one that disappeared, had a very low percent retail deposits, meaning a very concentrated deposit base and a very high number of loans and assets against their capital. Let's go to the other end of the spectrum. JP Morgan, 50% of their deposits come from individuals and they have the lowest amount 
of loans and assets versus their deposits. This is safe. This is risky. All banks are not created equally. They all are impacted by the sector, but we have to discern one from the other. When we looked at the banks that were impacted by the quality of their assets, at the top, you have JP Morgan with their capital at 14%. That's their tier one capital ratio. And if you adjust it for the impact of the fallen price of fixed income assets, it takes their capital down to a little over 11.5%. Take Silicon Valley Bancorp. They had 12% capital, but the impact for the unrealized losses on their assets took it to zero. Not a pretty picture. So when we look at our holdings in our top 10, number three holding in the firm is JP Morgan. It is the only very large bank we own in the US. We own no regional banks. It's seen rising relative strength since June. We have seen a series of higher highs and higher lows, and it remains above the 150 and 200 day moving average. It is basically where we were a week ago and trading better than almost 70% of the companies in the S&P over the last 52 weeks. We talked about Canadian banks, and we do have some Canadian bank exposure. If you look at deposit growth or contraction, US banks have seen some deposit contraction as money's left to go into things like T-bills or money market funds, while the Canadian deposit base has continued to grow. That's a different risk profile. Our large holding here is Royal Bank, this is the other major bank in our top 10 holdings. And on the week, it was up 2.6%, and it continues to behave quite well. Yes, it's pulled back, pulled back from 140 to 130, but we're getting paid a great yield and there's great dividend growth in the story. Just to break it out for you, 51% of our financials exposure is banks. That's down from 55% last week. If our overall financials exposure is 20%, that means we have 10% banks, which is well less than half of the banks in the index. So we have an underweight in banks. We do have an overweight in some insurance and some commercial services and diversified financial services. So moving on from that epicenter of the problem, let's examine the rest of the groups. Industrials, which has been a major holding for us over the last year, has continued to see rising relative strength in a series of higher highs and higher lows. The VIS ETF is an almost equally weighted basket of the largest industrial companies. So, of course, in industrials, we have the aerospace and defense companies like Raytheon, uh, like Lockheed Martin, like Boeing, like Northrop Grumman. They certainly have acted well. We talked about those over the course of the year. They're raising, rising, trading above the rising 200 day, the rising 150 day moving average. Uh, and they've been putting in a series of higher highs and higher lows, even trading higher than where we were in January and December. And again, over the past week, actually up over the, over the week. If we take the uh, equipment companies and machinery companies, which we've talked a little bit about, ATS would be one of our larger holdings, trading very close to a new all time high. Among the other companies in the group that we own, Ingersoll Rand continues to trade well, Bombardia continues to trade well. The industrials continue to be quite strong. Materials. Materials have been among the strongest groups in the market over the last two years. They did certainly pull back over the last two weeks to the 200 day moving average where things held, which is above the December lows. And as we close today, still above the 200 day moving average, and consolidating the gains that they've been be making since before the market bottomed in September. So again, bottoming is a process. When we look inside the materials group, if we were to look at the steel group, which is one that's been particularly strong. Again, higher lows all the way along, trading above a rising 200 day moving average. And if we were to look at the gold group, which we talked about last week, interesting. <coughs> Gold last week was challenging the top end of this consolidation range that had been in since 2020 when it made a multi-year high. This is quite a, a prolific technical price pattern. It's called a cup and handle. It's probably one of the highest percentage uh, technical setups you can get. We said last week, if we were to be able to exit above this channel, 
likely some good things can happen. And as we closed the week last week on the weekly bars, we did close above this channel. Now, it doesn't mean we're going to go straight higher. Very often when you trade above a channel like this, you'll come back and test it for a week or two. But certainly, I think that's another bullish development and things continue to look better for the precious metals group. We highlighted last week that gold versus the S&P is going through a significant shift. And we always like to keep these things in mind. The last thing this last time this happened was in 2001. And then gold outperformed from 2001 through 2010. Could be interesting. We'll have to see. Moving on, energy. We talked last week about the, ener the group energy did have difficulty in the previous three weeks did break the long-term moving averages and forced us to reduce our weight. I think it's likely that this was uh, uh, hedge funds making a bet against liquidity in the market as something that they can short against a potentially weaker market. We'll have to see, but the Canadian group and the US group of energy producers are weaker on weaker oil prices. Again, we talked last week about taking our weighting down. Moving on to the other leadership groups, home construction was acting well last week, acted better through the course of the week, now broke above this trend that had been in place since it was correcting from the beginning of February. That's one of the stronger groups in the market. Our big weight is DH Horton, trading better than 94% of companies in the S&P 500 over the last 12 months. And then the other group that has been showing interesting improvement is technology. This is the XLK ETF. We talked about the fact in January that it had extended well above the 200-day moving average and likely would correct, and it did. But in the last six days, once again, is finding some strength and making relative gains versus the S&P. Now, we talked a little bit about the fact that semiconductors have shown improvement in breadth and is the most economically sensitive group. It's an important group to watch because it would be rare for the market to get into real difficulty when the semiconductors are improving. Why is that? Semiconductors have a very short inventory cycle. Companies don't like to keep lots of inventory on hand. They wanna know that they can use them in their products and get them out the door and get paid because semiconductors cost a lot of money. They also go obsolete quickly. So we know when the economy slows down, orders disappear quickly, and when the economy starts to improve, the order book fills up quickly. We know that there was a situation last year where there was a shortage of semiconductors, lots of people overordered, and there was some concern that there could be a glut. It's interesting to see that the semis are acting particularly well. So this is a semiconductor ETF, rising relative strength since October, a substantially higher low in December, a substantially higher low at the end of, the, uh, uh, end of February. And as we're moving into March, moving back towards the highs, trading better than 90% of companies in the S&P 500. Our two big weights in this group, NVIDIA, for obvious reasons, is a company that will benefit from AI and the pro proliferation of AI models. And the second is Broadcom, AVGO, which is, 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 is a leader in the 5G chip space. Both of them acting much better than tech as a sector, both acting much better than the market <clears throat> and semiconductors acting stronger than tech as a whole. In the software space, we have Microsoft, which is trading better than 84% of companies in the S&P, more of a dividend growth play and Oracle, same thing, more of a dividend growth play. So look, this group had a very difficult year. Microsoft, like lots of other companies pulled back but made higher lows in December are trading above that long-term moving average and swinging back higher. We think these are pretty good bets. Now, over the last few weeks, we've talked about the fact that we started to see <clears throat> some global markets outperform the US market. We got tested this week. The big question was, would Credit Suisse go bankrupt? And would that have a major impact on the EU and then the EU banking group? Well, here we are a week later, the Euro stocks 50 did sell off. And over the last one, two, three, four, five days, right back to the 50 day moving average, very close back to highs and very, very resilient. 
What do we like to see when there's a sell-off? We like to see relative strength the moment there is improvement in the market. And we certainly have seen that in the Euro stocks 50. A low in September before the October low. A higher low in December than above the 50-day and the 200-day. Way above the 200-day today. <clears throat> and despite the fact that there was an existential threat to the EU, EU banking system, some clearly some newfound confidence. And we've seen the nice bounce in this group. Mexico, which had been leading the US, continues to lead basically at the 50 day moving average and continues to act well. So international stocks continue to look, in, look interesting. Now things that have been weak, is there anything that's changing? Well, high dividend paying stocks, just like fixed income, have continued to be relatively weaker. You can see relative strength versus the S&P falling since the beginning of January. Effectively, the super dividend ETF, which is made up of high dividend paying stocks, is trading effectively around where the market was in October when it made its lows. Significant underperformance. And it's made up of REITs, which are making relative strength new lows, utilities, which are making relative strength new lows, Consumer staples, which were a little better this week, but still underperforming, and healthcare, which continues to look weak. So my message that I take away from the market is that the economically sensitive groups still act quite well. I think so far from what we've seen in the financial services group, the weakness was pretty targeted in some banks that had very poor risk controls. When we look at dividends, it's very clear. Dividend growth stocks continue to outperform high dividend paying stocks. So the long-term picture hasn't shifted. Equities in general remain in a structural bull market. Global equities are looking a little more interesting than the S&P. Fixed income looks not interesting at all other than very short-term bonds, which is a place to hold some cash. Dividend growth continues to lead which makes sense if we think that rates are going to be sticky. And when we look at our weightings, we reflect all of these things. The fact that we have a significant weight in short-term government bonds means that we've got some dry powder for when our indicators turn higher. We've been holding off on putting new positions on. We have a little bit less in financials, but we have a low weight in banks. The banks that we own are the safest, highest quality banks in North America. We have about a 50% weight in technology, but our technology positions are acting well. Industrials are significant overweight. We have a small overweight versus the S&P or an underweight versus the TSX in energy. Our materials are an overweight. We have some short-term corporate bonds and a little bit of cash and then underweights and consumer discretionary, consumer staples, communications, healthcare, real estate, and utilities, the more defensive groups. Look, people time seems longer than market time. And we are going through a process to digest likely the end of this rate cycle coming from the Fed. We're digesting the stress that is put on some institutions with poor risk controls. And on a relative basis, the sectors that we're focusing in are holding in quite well. But it's a step-by-step -step process. Credit spreads are not blowing out. This is when credit spreads blow out. This was COVID. This was the excess return a bond investor was demanding to buy an investment grade bond. And this was nothing like what happened in 2008, which was much, much worse. Where we sit today, is better than where we were in October and certainly not blowing out. We're gonna watch it. We're gonna look for any sign that it's changing. From a volatility perspective, this was the spike in volatility in 2020. These are the various spike points over 2022 where volatility spiked at the worst points in the market. And again, we spiked last week to a lower level and very quickly, volatilities dropped over the course of this week back into a normal range. So we got to continue to watch. We think we continue to be in a structural bull market. We will get more defensive 
if things get worse. We have between 25 and 35% cash across most of our portfolios. It gives us flexibility as things start to improve and as our short-term indicators improve. We can't manufacture a better market environment. We can only deal with the market that we've got. And I feel very comfortable that we're positioned in great places right now. So with that, Pamela, if there's any questions, I'm certainly happy to answer them. Hi, Dave. Of course, we always have somebody um, here asking a question to get your insights. Uh, thank you so much. Sebastian wants to know your thoughts on silver. I know you touched a little bit on precious metals, but perhaps you could expand in that space if possible. Sure. Let's see if I can. Uh, so um, let's look at it this way. First of all, if we just start with silver itself. So uh, this is a, a, a five-year chart. Let's make it a one-year chart. Let's take it off log. Okay. So a lot like stocks, we made a low in October. Uh, we made we retested lows uh, in March. We're trading above the 200-day and the 50-day moving average. It's showing some improvement. The thing that we want to compare against is gold, because ultimately, if we're going to have a real precious metals market, you're likely to want to see silver start to outperform gold. And this is this is the the big question. And I have to look at this another way. There's the silver gold ratio. So this way. Okay. So if we do a comparison through the period where gold was correcting, the silver gold relationship, silver versus gold, was falling. We made a low in uh, uh, September, August, September period. When gold rallied out of the summer, silver outperformed. Now you can see we broke this long term trend when that took place. And very often when you've got a declining trend line like that, you rally and you're going to come back and retest from the upside, which we did over the last two weeks. We had a sharp reversal last week. We had outperformance today. So I think that this is a harbinger. Even though precious metals were weak today, they came, they pulled back and retested the top end of the range they've just broken out of, that this is setting up. Now, silver is a little bit more economically sensitive. There's some industrial uses beyond investment uses. So uh, that certainly probably has been a drag during the period where stocks were correcting. But I do think that this reversal in the silver gold ratio portends something. And it's certainly something to watch over the next few days and few weeks. If silver can start to outperform, then likely we have a real precious metals market coming at us. Dave, that, uh, let's see if we have any other questions here. Um, oh, actually, this is an interesting one, just because we haven't spoken about crypto recently. Uh, Dave, any thoughts there? Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I've been a bit shy about this. Um, I think most people know I, I post generally three or four things a day in, in the last two weeks. For the first time in a while, I've posted a little bit about crypto. Um, we certainly have been seeing things act better. There's a it's a weekly chart. Let's put it in the log form. Uh, so this is Ether. Uh, we had a low in June. Uh, we had uh, a low in November. Uh, we certainly had a, a higher low in December and January, trading above long-term moving averages, 250 week. Um, something's something's happening. Um, I was showing. Um, uh, Ether versus the S and P. Let's see if I can just find that ratio. Yeah, Ether versus the S and P. So you know something's happening here. Um, gold is acting better than the S and P. Ether is acting better than the S and P. 
To be honest, I think the most likely issue is that we've seen in the last couple of weeks a willingness of the central banks to turn on a dime and start printing money again. The backstop for the banking system, the guarantee for depositors, I think is, is loosening conditions. So while the Fed has been uh, shrinking its balance sheet in the treasury market, it very quickly expanded its balance sheet back into the banks. So things that you can't print, things that are scarce, things like commodities, things like gold, things like crypto, may be an interesting asset here if, uh, if uh, central banks start to print uh, currency again. Thanks so much, David. Well, that concludes the questions we've received this afternoon. As always, uh, we'd like to thank you so much for taking the time. And if there are questions out there that uh, you were too shy to ask, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We are always available and uh, would be pleased to, to have a conversation. Dave, I'll leave you with the final word. Yeah, look, this, this continues to be a hard market for people to get their head around. Um, it's a hard market to manage money through. There's just no way around it. Uh, a lot of moving parts and, and all we can do is put one foot in front of the other. Um, you got to make the best decisions that you can. And this kind of market depend, depend, de demands a lot of patience. I think it's going to be really interesting to see how the market reacts to the Fed this week. Um, my guess is that we probably get a 25 basis point hike. And it's all going to come down to the language that we get around that hike from Fed Chair Powell. Uh, so uh, against the backdrop of what we've got and what we've been seeing, we'll be interested to see if there's any change whatsoever. Um, but uh, uh, it'll be it'll be an interesting week. Uh, I'm happy to have a little bit of dry powder uh, because when we do get a shift in the short term indicators, it likely will be that there is a good long run in front of us. Uh, but when that happens, we have to wait and see. So anyway, thanks everybody for joining us. If you've got questions you're too shy to ask, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, if you're interested, you know, certainly don't hesitate to, to follow us on Twitter, um, regular poster. And uh, we've got lots of interesting things to say. And, and uh, if you're not interested in that, well, we'll be back next Tuesday. So thanks everybody for joining. Thanks, Pamela. Thanks, Dave.